Okay, wonderful. Uh, so, hi everyone. It's really good to see all of you that I can see. It's really interesting. We are in our third day of our uh, Millie Bloom Disability Studies Conference on Accessible Futures Intersecting Futurity and Disability. And one of the things that we've been bringing up, of course, also in our little chats with one another, but also uh, you know, in the topics themselves is everything that COVID brings with it. Uh, and as much as um, I don't like it, I really don't like these few past months, I do appreciate the little thing in it, like having the possibility to see all of you up here on my screen and having the possibility to see people uh, let's say that are not native to our meetings that we haven't seen you before. So uh, I appreciate it. I see some new names and some new faces and welcome everyone. Um, so this is something that we've been doing the, at the Center for Disability Studies, which has been open for about four years. And we try to dedicate a couple of days each year to our uh, uh, we usually bring our international guests to Israel and have a two-day conference. So here, of course, we have the conference uh, Corona style, and I'm happy that we are still here with this type of conference. Uh, some of the technological stuff that I'm sure all of you are already used to, but just to say this, um, you should know that we are live also on our Facebook. It's an opportunity to also tell all of you to come and join our Facebook uh, many of the things are in Hebrew, but at least once a year we do have some things in English and we appreciate having the possibility to practice our language. So you can, you're always uh, welcome to join us on our Facebook and look at our um, various activities. You can also feel free if you want to in the chat box to put your email if you need more information or want us to send you information on upcoming events and join our newsletter, you can do this. Uh, the chat box, of course, is also going to be used for questions, so feel free to ask any questions during the talks that we're going to have. Uh, I try to promise you that we'll get to as many of them as possible. Uh, you don't have to write in English if you don't feel comfortable. If you rather write a question in Hebrew, um, that's basically the two languages that I can deal with, so only Hebrew and English. Uh, if someone can deal with a different language, they can also translate. That's good. Uh, feel free to ask any question that you have and we'll try to get to it. Uh, you can also raise your hand and things like this. Um, I think that's about, about all the information I have for you in terms of technology and rules, uh, which brings me to the part that I like in which I can introduce our first speaker. So it's an honor for me to introduce uh, Fiona Kumari Campbell, Professor of Disability and Ableism Studies at the School of Education and Social Work, University of Dundee, Scotland, which makes me think, is it raining or not, and how much I would appreciate some rain now. Uh, so Fiona is the co-lead on the Peripheries Research and Academic Scholarship theme at ESW. In 2019, Fiona became a fellow of the RSA. She's also an adjunct professor in disability studies at the University of Kiliana, Sri Lanka. Fiona has written extensively on issues related to disability, a philosophy and sociology of ableism, disability in Sri Lanka law, biotechnology, and is recognized as a world leader in scholarship around studies in ableism. Her famous publication is Contours of Ableism, the Production of Disability and Ableness. Uh, Fiona will talk with us about the premise of studies in ableism facing the current crisis. This presentation will discuss the assertion that studies in ableism can focus on groups beyond disability, for example, race, might dilute the claims and specificity of the disability experience. Fiona will argue that studies in ableism as political theory and as a template for practice can bring together disparate communities in solidarity to work towards accessible futures for the subtle terms of the world. So thanks for joining us, Fiona, and we are ready to hear you. Uh, thank you, Saharim uh, Tovarim. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, 
I will be reading from this paper because um, as I mentioned earlier, I find that with PowerPoint, I talk too long and then I run out of time <laughs> and I'm hoping not to do this. Uh, I understand a link to the paper has been um, made in the chat site, but it will be sent out. Uh, it is a fairly dense paper, but uh, let's get on with it. And uh, this is a great opportunity. So I start off with the heading, the challenge. So this paper brings together my provisional thoughts, and that's important because I'm always thinking. In fact, I've sent the organisers five, ver five versions of this paper already, which might be quite annoying for them. But it's so my provisional thoughts about how studies in ableism, which I will now call SIA, SIA because studies in ableism is too long, how studies in ableism as a paradigm can be utilised by both researchers and activists for coalition building among minoritised groups working towards accessible futures for all, um, to create a world where everybody can flourish, um, is a challenging task, uh, full of many pitfalls, and there is a need for careful clarifications and precision. And I might just add here to also engage in many uncomfortable conversations. Um, if you can just go on to the next slide, actually. Uh, the task, uh, uh, the so, so clarifications. So uh, Wendy Brown, um, a US researcher, has pointed that out that the terms of engagement in human rights and anti-discrimination claims has mainly been through the discourse of identity politics. Brown rightly points out that in the development of anti-discrimination claims, the petitioner, either as an individual or as a group, is required to show they have suffered. Okay, so suffering is a really important aspect of claims to anti-discrimination. So, so claims for protection of human rights are based on the argument that a particular group has a particular kind of suffering and, then, and hence is in need of protection by the law. In the US context, this means drawing on the provisions of the 14th Amendment to the US Constitution, which aims at guaranteeing equality for all and hence defines protected groups or what they call suspect class, I must say that is a funny phrase, uh, who have been historically vulnerable to discrimination. A suspect class is a class of individuals marked by immutable characteristics. What do we mean by immutable characteristics? The characteristics that cannot be changed. Um, such as race, religion, national origin or alienage. They are also who to be considered a discrete insular minority. And that's an important phrase, discrete insular minority. You will find that the Americans with Disabilities Act also describes disabled people as a discrete insular minority. And because of this, they are entitled to equal protection of the law by means of judicial scrutiny. Interestingly, disabled people, especially those with intellectual disabilities and the, and the poor have, have been found by the US Supreme Court to not be considered as a suspect car, class worthy of heightened scrutiny of US law. Now you might be wondering, why have I referenced US constitutional law, given that this is a presentation that has international reach and international concerns? I've done so for two reasons. Firstly, the global development of civil rights movements has often been shaped by strategies adopted by uh, US activists. Hence, today we often speak of my, a minority group um, or a minority rights model. The articulation of social justice claims globally has been through establishing certain political, moral and pragmatic identities to articulate the claims of marginal people. Secondly, you will see that from what I've already described, identity politics claims are often framed by cordoning off uh, ring fencing identity formation. In other words, if you have a suspect class or a particular identity category, you need to be very clear about who's included in that group and um, who is excluded. There is political and emotional investment by activists and governments for different reasons in classificatory practices and ensuring that any outliers are ejected or rejected from associations. Uh, um, slide three. Great, sorry. I have to keep up with the slides here. Uh, more than this, there is the idea of entrapment. The policing of identity becomes a paradox or becomes paradoxical. That is, in order to promote an identity, the marginal group becomes entrapped by its preconditions. In other words, it becomes entrapped by the qualifications for membership. Next slide, thank you. Um, 
Brown uh, uh, points to the travails of this paradoxical relation when she articulates, and I've got this slide because it's quite a long quote. The, the problem surfaces in the question of when and whether rights for women, and I've just added other groups here, other marginal groups, disabled, gay, are formulated in a way to enable the escape of the subordinated from the site of that violation and when and whether they build a fence around us at that site rather than regulating, sorry, regulating rather than challenging the conditions within. And the paradox within this problem is this, the more highly specified rights are as rights for women, LGBT or disabled, the more likely they are to build that fence insofar as they are more likely to encode a definition of woman or definition of disabled or LGBTQ premised upon our subordination in the trans historical discourse of, of liberal jurisprudence. Next slide. You may need to kind of really go back and read that. Uh, carefully. So one vehicle to unshackle minoritised people from discrete insular minority version of identity politics has been to pursue self-identification jurisprudence. So this has been a way of kind of breaking open those walls. On first glance, this approach may appear to be liberating and in accordance with the principles of self-determination and a rejection of biomedicalism and essentialism. A common trajectory of the self-identification movement can be found, and I'm gonna list the number of areas this has expressed itself, can be found in the claims, firstly, of transgender activist advocacy around self-identification and gender recognition certification. With some critique by gender critical feminists to argue that gender self-identification erodes the stabilization of sex-based rights attached to the legal definition, legal notion of woman but it doesn't just stay there. Trending, albeit a little bit more subtly, is an advocacy of disability self-identification. And I should note that our university's uh, teaching union has actually adopted this. Uh, advocacy of disability self-identification with limited exploration at this point in time of intended and unintended consequences for people traditionally recognized as disabled. There has been some degree of resistance as well as support for racialized self-identification, more controversially regarding individuals who believe that they are in the wrong raced body. Uh, next slide. Instead of, um, oh sorry, actually go back, sorry, go back, thank you. Uh, instead of resolving the paradoxes that Brown speculated upon in 2000, recent trending towards self-identification um, to access, uh, sorry, recent trends towards self-identification raises a whole host of new paradoxes and new questions related to open-ended and open-boarded approach to identities. Now, I've labored this argument somewhat at the start of this paper to show that there are risks in articulating a uh, politics of coalition building using the concept of ableism to phrase our understandings of social exclusion. Identity politics is focused on building uh, walls, walls of difference, differences that are often promulgated on the basis of hierarchies or at least the ranking of human suffering. Challenging those walls of exclusive insularity through a focus on patterns and convergences between and amongst marginalised communities uh, actually could be seen as a threat. Some argue, and I know we have some Indian uh, colleagues here today, it was actually in the reading group that we had, that just at the time that disabled people have made gains in political rights, studies in ableism focuses on groups beyond disability, for example, race, caste, ethnic and religious minorities. And in that focus, we might actually dilute or detract from the claims and specificity of, uh, of, of, of the disability experience. Furthermore, furthermore, one must be vigilant around moves uh, to scale suffering. And we see this scaling that we suffer worse than you and having this hierarchy of suffering. As Randall Kennedy once remarked, he refused to become an accountant of atrocity. The rest of this presentation is a response to that inquiry and the valuable insights that studies in ableism provides towards coalition building. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, in Fiona, this can I Can I ask you just to, to go just a bit slower for some of our, uh, our Hebrew speaking class? No problems. It's probably my anxiety a little bit and Thanks. also and also scaredness about, <laughs> about, about running out of time. Okay, so in the next section, I'm going to revisit the concept of ableism. Okay, uh, so ableism is everybody's business, not just because of some ide ideological chanting, but because we as living creatures 
human and animal are affected by the spectre and spectrum of the abled body. It's critical that ableism stops being thought of as just a disability issue. Ablement, that's a new word, the process of becoming abled, impacts on daily routines, interactions, speculations, and significantly how we imagine humans to be. While all people are affected by ableism, we are not all impacted by ableist practices in the same way. Actually, some people benefit from ableism. They become entitled by virtue of institutional ableism and in different settings. And actually, I think we need to do more research in this area in terms of uh, how some groups actually benefit from institutional ableism. So that's something for people to think about. Disabled women started speaking and writing about ableism as early as 1981 um, in a special issue of the journal Off Our Backs. In 2001, when writing about the denotation of disability within courts of law, I observed ableism as a knowledge system that was used to either uh, ascertain, in other words, give credibility or nullify the defining of disability. So in the court system, there's often lots of battles about whether a person is considered disabled or not, okay? I framed ableism, and next slide, and those of you who've been following my work, you probably know this, it's been done to death. <laughs> it's uh, uh, ableism as a network of beliefs, processes and practices that produce a particular kind of self and body. It becomes the bodily standard that is projected as perfect, species typical, and therefore essential and fully human. Disability is then cast off as a diminished state of being human. Now, remember I wrote this in 2001. If I was to go back and change this, I would put disability and maybe put some of the other categories of minoritized people. There is no space in this presentation to fully discuss the spectrum of ableism conceptually and its practices. And I do recommend visiting my academia edu site. So I've come today with some sense that people have some understanding of ableism and there's lots of um, articles on that site, including a three page summary, I should say. This way of understanding of ableism held for over a decade, but I did feel a need to be more specific, next slide, um, about what its key characteristics are that myself and others had observed, um, but also marked out other marginalized peoples. And you can see now I'm now starting to, as I'm developing my work over two decades, to think, hang on a minute, this experiences that happen to disabled people are also happening in the same, but also sometimes different ways to other minoritized groups. So I'm just gonna read this quote and I am going to now, and then I will explain through the rest of the paper, some of these aspects. Uh, so it's ableism is a system of dividing practices, partitioning people. Ableism institutes a reification and classification of populations. Okay, it talks about types of people. Um, ableist systems involve, and here's our five prongs, the differentiation, ranking, negation, prioritization, and notification of sentient life. So the point of studies in ableism then is to turn the spotlight on the idea of ableness and how ablement is preserved preserved. In, in, in other words, we need to invert our gaze. So instead of looking at disability, examine the conditions of, of ableness. What does this mean? An able-bodiedness, for example, these words that we use every day. Uh, and what is the basis of becoming enabled? Right? How do we enable ourselves? These dividing practices, which could be thought which could be through classification systems or legal definitions. Actually, you find that the classification systems often are also legally defined. So uh, this is really important. It invokes a series of dehumanizing practices that result in the disqualification of a human person or indeed demarcations between the human and non-human. My first published piece in 1999, even though I didn't use the term ableism, was about genealogies in history of thinking about what is human and what is not. So I actually look at some of the philosophical developments where philosophers like John Locke are trying to work out whether a person is a human or a subhuman or somewhere in between. 
and also looking at, it also looked at how human life is scaled. Indeed, there is an impassable divide between human and animal, with some like Peter Singer ask, uh, arguing that certain clusters of humans, intellectually disabled, uh, aged people, have defined, defined characteristics that disqualify and should have less rights claims to other forms, higher forms of life. Peter Singer in Practical Ethics articulates that the value of a life of a life should be based on the traits of rationality, autonomy and self-consciousness. For him, and I quote, defective infants lack these characteristics and hence killing them therefore cannot be equated with killing a normal, normal human beings or any other self-conscious beings, end of quote. I should say, actually, I was taught by uh, Peter Singer when I was a young student in my first year. So this is uh, interesting. Uh, conversely, there are, exam there are examples of certain categories of human who have persisted, persist persistently been deemed as animalistic, such as Jews, homosexuals, Dalits, and even women as a sex class. Ableism operates through the apparatus of animalization. Commonly, we refer to dehumanization in the scaling of humans. But what is really meant by the levers of inhuman? What do we mean by this? A life here is denoted as brute, disposable, and not having grievable capacity. In other words, like their lives are so lacking that we don't even mourn for them. Uh, when they die, and you can see this in the, some of the differences, like in uh, mourning of refugees. Um, next slide. Abel is, uh, Agamben puts it, and he uses the phrase bare life, is designated by law, but outside its remit. So these people are designated by law, but they're not controlled by necessarily by regal leg regulation. The idea of life prioritises the sheer biological fact of life in contrast with the way a life is lived and esteemed. And I've referred to my five prongs here and I'm not going to actually uh, read these out because I've already mentioned them. Uh, again, just to say differentiation, ranking, negation, notification, prioritisation. Now I'm going to start talking about those aspects, not all of them because the paper is uh, short. Um, but some of them. So the next section, we can keep this slide up anyway, if you want. Uh, next section is what I call casting ableism. For some time, my own research has explored um, Indian philosophy, Buddhism, and to a lesser extent, Confucianism, to provide insights into other ways of thinking about the other and ideas of self, ideas of suffering, and ideas of ontology. I have been exposed to two hereditary systems of human ranking and social inclusion and social exclusion. The first is the North Korean Sonbun system where ranking and differentiation result in inequalities being assigned at birth and this affects residential, employment, schooling capabilities. And then the more familiar Indian caste system, which is also hereditary and determinative to the extent that any gains in education public or financial status do not change a, da a caste designation. Notably, that despite the enactment of anti-caste laws and affirmative measures to deal with historical and contemporary discrimination, uh, which affect the public domain, casteism is still element evident in daily acts of segregation and hospitalities in private domains. Ac who can access what space, uh, who can talk to whom, uh, even what I've called uh, householder communications, just even the thing of being invited into somebody else's house to share food, for example. Caste is really associated with ableism or disability, and it is viewed as a self-contained religious regional arcane system affecting albeit one large country. However, the, the caste system is fundamental to understanding and thinking about humanization and dehumanization of social life. What I argue in this paper is studying caste relations can provide insight into the operation, justification and apologetic defences of societies where there is segregation, desegregation and integrated communities. Those at the lower ranks of the system or indeed beyond the caste system are considered as subhumans, less than human, in fact worse than beasts. We are speaking of the ranking of certain shades of human morphology. So how is caste related to ableism? You can do the next slide now.
Caste, and I should have underlined this in bold in my paper, casteism can be seen as the prototype of all types of human estrangement. Ableism's focus on negation as an element captures this radical othering, a marked separation. So negation produces this sense of us and them. Villasuri and Patria define caste as, and this is one of the better definitions I came across, particular historically and culturally located form of human categorization involving visual determinations, determinants, sorry, marked on the body through the interplay of perceptual practices and bodily appearances. Caste has not had one meeting, one meaning or a single essential criterion but its meanings have always been mediated through visual appearances. And I think that's significant. The criteria that determine caste identity have included ancestry experience, outside perception, internal perception, what you think of yourself, coded visibility, habits and practices. All of these and more are variously invoked for both individuals and groups. Caste then evokes three aspects, and this is where the commonalities come in with other groups. Repulsion, hierarchy, and hereditary specialization. And this is deduced on the basis of certain visual determinants such as color, described social stigma, stark po poverty, ancestry, outside perception, habits, and practices. Disability and backwardness are representations that are engaged communally as part of social, legal, and political interventions to mitigate the negative effects of the caste system within the Indian state. So there's actually uh, legislation that, for example, which uh, is legislation for what's called the backward classes. Um, and uh, certain class groups actually are uh, uh, described in terms of being part of a, uh, a, a disabled uh, 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 class. You would be forgiven for thinking that caste, the caste system is self-contained and unrelated to any other systems of differentiations and ranking. Rosemary Garland Thompson's 1996 book, Freakery, Cultural Spectacles of the Extraordinary Body, began to make the connection between disability and scientific racism. Now, that's an edited collection. Um, some articles are more explicit about this connection than, than others. In the chapters of the book, we see linkages between scientific racism, animality, colonialism, and disability, although ableism is not specifically mentioned as a concept, and I think it's because of the time that it was written. One example, a case in point, concerns the exhibiting of a woman named Julia Pastrana, an Indigenous woman from Mexico. Julia was referred to as the girl with the ape face or in another exhibit, this stuff makes you cry, the ugliest woman in the world. Although Julia died in 1860, and there's an error in the printout for the paper, it's 1860, her body continued to be exhibited for a hundred years. It is in her story that we see the convergence of racialized representations and medicalization. Now I want to move, and this will become familiar as we go to scientific racism as a cloak of ableism, Question mark. The introduction of the infamous 1935 Nuremberg Laws of the German Reich brought together the racialized caste Jewishness as well as genetic genealogy. Robertson, Lay and Light, and if you haven't come across this book, 19, oh, sorry, 2019, a brilliant book, the first, uh, the first, uh, into, the first into the dark, the Nazi persecution yeah. of, the dis of the disabled. That's what it's called. The first into the dark, the Nazi persecution yeah, of the disabled. Uh, somebody's got their speakers on. Um, brings to attention, and excuse my pronunciation, yeah. the Krankenmord, the event of the systematic murder of 216,000 people with physical, mental, and emotional disabilities. They note in eugenics discourses, ableism and racism were kindred bedfellows. Uh, during the middle of the 20th century. And I will say what is refreshing about this book, this is the first book that actually uses the concept of ableism and brings these two together. It's quite an interesting book. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this. There's been debates about whether uh, the T4 program, for example, was a precursor to the Holocaust or whether in fact it was a continuation of a um, uh, underlying ideology. I'm not gonna say any more here because that's where I get distracted. Um, 
Indeed, Nazi persecution on the grounds of race, disability, homosexism were enabled by the regime's creation of categories of biological otherness. The Nazis used scientific discourses or metaphors such as cancer, infection or genetic impurity to position and describe such biological others as threats resulting in the creation of the concept of a master race. Even today's ideas of feeble-mindedness, intelligence testing and psychiatric diagnosis, which categorise people, endure. And these labels continue to exclude, marginalise, stigmatise and discredit individuals falling under its purview. The point is, ableism creates whole pools of people saturated by lower expectations or are viewed as characterologically suspect. In other words, their very character, their very nature is suspicious. Maybe more correctly, it also ushers in this denotation of people who are different. There is an older history that shattered the idea of, of the fundamental equality of human beings. Angela Saini argues that it was the discovery of the continent of Australia by white folk that helped shatter the enlightenment belief in the idea of human unity and common capabilities. Here, of course, we have the emergence of the idea of comparison with the benchmark reference being the abled bodied that's raced and white. Sorry, I'm seeing the chats coming up here. Uh, Europe, white European human subject. From, so in other words, in order to have a comparison, the benchmark are these, these white able-bodied men. Um, today's version of exponents of scientific racism term themselves racial realists. Okay, so that's what they, they don't say they're racists, they call themselves racial realists. And instead of the classic racial markers, these racial realists manipulate language by using terms such as human variation, populations, in ethnicity and human biodiversity. See, these don't sound offensive, do they? According to Saini, these protagonists argue that quite different ethnicities should be encouraged to do what they do best. Every person in a diverse society has a place. It's just not the same place. We, here we have ranking and differentiating practices being normalized in the form of language that appears to come out of a, a equality paradigm. Next slide. Can I ask how I'm going on time here? Sorry. It is 2.35. Sorry? It's 2.35. Okay, so we how much? We have about uh, 25 more minutes. Oh, thank goodness. Thank you. This is, um, and can I say this is a delight to be given the proper time because sometimes there is such pressure to get through complex ideas too quickly and then we have the language issue. So thank you very much. I want to move on to the re-emergence, or should I stay, say stark unveiling of eugenics discourses around ableism during this time of COVID-19. And this is an overview. I could write a whole paper on this, okay? Saini provides a useful definition of eugenics. And it's up there on your screen. Eugenics is a cold, calculated way of thinking about human life, reducing human beings to nothing but parts of the whole. It also assumes that almost all that we are is decided before we are born." End of quote. During the global COVID-19 pandemic, we are witnessing the return of soft eugenics, as well as the legitimization of scientific racism. The expansion of self-identification jurisprudence to bolster nationalist politics. Now, I just want to stop here because I didn't discuss this in the paper, but there are a number of countries and, the, and, uh, and academics now that are participating in eugenicist journals to show that, the, uh, that citizens of their country are genetically superior, particularly in terms of intelligence. So this is an interesting uh, growth. This is not a black white issue. We are now seeing uh, all sorts of interesting countries, um, China, Japan, Iran, um, who are now uh, using scientific racism to say that uh, their people are um, genetically superior. But I didn't have a chance to discuss this. Coupled with the rise of popular genetic genealogy, we members of the public are seduced by technologies to determine our origin. And you think about the ancestry testing 
um, and 23andMe, for example, of having big boosts in sales. We are also seeing an emerging strain of genetic determinism in the public imagination. The current discussions around COVID-19 bring together discourses around disability and race in close proximity. June and July 2020 saw the publication of two very contentious papers. The first was by Richard Lynn and Gerhard Meisenberg, 2020, and it was titled Race Differences in Deaths from Coronavirus in England and Wales, Demographics, Poverty, Pre-existing Conditions or Intelligence? Question mark. I must say I'm even nervous citing this paper because I don't want these people to get citations, uh, but I have to expose them. The second paper is in the mainstream journal, Society, that's what the name of the journal, it came out in July 2020, written by Lawrence M. Mead, and it was titled Poverty and Culture. The first paper argued that the high incidence of COVID-19 in black and brown populations was not due to demographics or poverty, or indeed the high employment of black and brown folk in the UK National Health Service. Instead, they argued that these differential death rates were caused by differences in intelligence. Unbelievable. The second paper took a different but similar approach. This paper explored the reasons for high levels of poverty and unemployment amongst black and Hispanic people in the United States. The authors argued that the incidence of poverty rates was due to an underlying behavioral poverty, in other words, like mentally, mentally poor thinking, right, of black and Hispanic people because they lacked the adoption of Western norms, in particular socialization around work and motivational practices. And I've just noted in the footnotes to this paper that article has since been retracted by that journal. How it got through, this is a mainstream journal, is quite uh, shocking. I attended a webinar sponsored by iACID titled New Genetics and COVID-19, held on 29th of June 2020, so very recently. At this seminar, several speakers, including myself, noted an increase in public proclamations by scientists, government officials and politicians that had a eugenicist stench about them. There was testimony about the differential treatment of disabled, aged and confined persons and their access to personal protective materials, testing and to medical interventions in hospitals. Medical practices around COVID-19 management drew upon pre-existing medical and clinical criteria that ranked human need and medical classification practices without paying heed to the social context and requirements of individuals. In other words, there was this disconnect between this classifications and how myself and others as disabled people actually lived our lives. Okay. The, sp the, the speech effects about herd immunity, I don't know if that phrase is used in Israel, but it is used in the UK, herd immunity um, and Collateral damage, in other words, some people will just die. We have to, they are disposable. Made by clinicians and politicians alike was gaining credibility as permissible speech. Permissible speech is like, what I'm meaning here is, it, it, this was not embarrassing. It was okay to say these, these kinds of statements about people, right? So that's why it's permissible. So we have in the UK, for example, a framework produced by NICE that stipulated which population and groups would not have access to procedures and that determined the decision to compel do not resuscitation, do not resuscitate orders. In fact, actually families and disabled people were, were not included in uh, any discussions about whether they wanted to have a do not resuscitate um, order. It was only as a result of an outcry by disabled people the disability rights movement and some sections of the health and co social care sector that, the, that NICE modified their guidelines. At the same time, there was a tension around identifying which sections of the community were more, more vulnerable to acquiring COVID-19 and therefore needed to be shielded and stay at home. Again, we have a situation and where clinicians were being put in charge of developing enumerative data indicating how many vulnerable or disabled people required assistance. I think the other thing I wanted to say is these clinicians were not 
general clinicians about COVID, they were specialists around COVID modeling. So giving such authority to a very narrow group of uh, clinicians is um, extremely problematic. This data, so where did they get their data from? It was drawn from drug prescription records and not the social care databases. So that should be raising red flags as well. This raises a linkage with one or more of the other prongs of ableism, namely, namely notification. It is a vexed question regarding the registration of disabled people and whether that is a good idea in its usefulness for increasing access to services and also for governments to be able to plan better for the needs and rights of disabled people. And that was actually a discussion on the IACID webinar too, you know, this whole issue, what countries register, do you have a disability card? Um, Initially, it might make things in life seem simpler and easier, but what is the bad side of registering people according to these kind of typologies? So this is a question. However, we have a system that could be used to register how many disabled people there are, um, disability management statistics, but these could be potentially linked up with other covert management in initiatives, which may be less desirable, such as the do not resuscitate orders previously mentioned. So I guess that get the point here is we now are living in a new era of data sharing. So whilst you might register as a disabled person for one purpose or register as black and brown or having religious registration, it could be used uh, in other ways unintended for data sharing. There have been attempts in some countries to have COVID-19 legislation trump or at least suspend existing human rights legislative protections. At the IACID seminar, there was some discussion about the government of disability and the potential dangers of data sharing, which I've already spoken about. The point of the prong of notification is not an exercise in disagreeing with the importance of data collection and enumeration. And I wanna make that point here. We need data collection. We need to know uh, uh, about disability to undertake planning and you know, social care responses. Yeah, just leave it on that slide at the moment. Notification points to, however, notification points to the locus of control. That locus in the contemporary field and historically has always been in the hands of ableist clinicians and professionals with the support of legal regulation under the guise of professionalism and scientism. Um, have had limited transparency for decision making and accountability. And when that accountability occurs, it's after long after the fact. And I think that we know this already. History has shown us that and the, the, the book that I mentioned on disability um, and the Nazi regime uh, sh shows the absolutely intrinsic and vital role that clinicians and doctors played um, and in, in the orchestration of these death killing machines. Um, uh, and, and um, legislation. In summary, we need to be vigilant about the rise of eugenics and its normalization. Saini points out to the fact that governments continue to use racial categories such as those in census forms, which do not necessarily map the lived uh, uh, experience and, and the true picture of uh, human variation. This disconnection in categories and people's lived experiences also extends to the classification of disabilities and holding on to diagnosticism to frame experiences of disablement. In fact, the debates over which groups are at risk for COVID-19 are very telling. We find, we find scientists routinely using racial and disability um, and clinical categories that are not only familiar to, familiar to them, but to the public. And yet in many ways, scientists are enveloped by the very categories that they use. And one of the references I've put here is to a wonderful book by um, Joan Fujimura. I really recommend it. And she talks about the bias of scientific methodologies. Uh, she is a sociologist and a scientist. So she's really got a good insider's view on this. As researchers and activists, we need to be mindful about examining the conditions of ableist relations, so conditions, and look to who benefits and who loses out. Ableism is a constantly shifting landscape. So when we examine ableist practices and processes, we, we, in order to develop interventions to change those practices, we need to look at the conditions. So this is, I want to stop here. This is a very good, important point. Ableism, you know, you can be overwhelmed by this idea of ableism and think, oh, nothing changes, what can we do? 
One of the things I argue, and I'm actually developing a research methodology around this, is how can we examine the conditions uh, at a particular time? And then while we work out what the conditions are, then we can develop interventions to change those conditions so we can change things, right? So we need to look at those conditions. We need to look at how, how certain conditions originate. What are its source? What are the processes of generation? So how, how does a silly idea take off? Like this, I don't know what's happening in Israel. We have this uh, conspiracy theory in the UK about the 5G telephone network like a crackpot idea that has suddenly become very mainstream, right? So how do they, how do these processes generate and take off? How are these conditions nourished and how do conditions act foundationally on society? Ableist systems attack on minoritized peoples, whether that be disabled people, black and brown people, religious minorities and others engage in the practice of humiliation that dehumanize and ultimately animalize human beings. Next slide, please. And this is a lovely quote from uh, Guri, a uh, lovely definition. If you want to use this a lovely definition of humiliation. Humiliation as claim does not choose its context. On the contrary, the context plays a far more determinative role in deciding the form and context of humiliation. It can be generally observed that society of the, of the socially dead cannot provide the active context for the articulation of humiliation or that a society with heaven on earth would make humiliation redundant. So even in the, the, good, the good society, what he's arguing is in the good society that suddenly humiliation would disappear. In fact, it is the context that decides the nature, level and intensity of humiliation. So uh, in the paper, I, I discuss that in a little bit more detail. I'm going to skip over that paragraph and just move along. You can read it because I know you will have the paper, which gives me great comfort that you have the paper because some of these ideas are uh, complex and you need to kind of uh, medit meditate over them. As Guru reminds us, humiliation always has a context, as does the UNCRPD preamble which understands the production of disability to occur within the context of interactions. Context and responses of technicism within society and its institutions towards the disabled and minoritized peoples often mask humiliating practices. Indeed, acts of humiliation are a direct attack on equality measures and run counter to an ethos of celebrating diversity. This is because humiliation is only possible when an individual already possesses a sense of self-determination. It is an assault on the self-respect of the victim. Now, I just want to clarify that. Actually, if you have such low self-esteem and believe that you are dirt and not valuable, uh, you may not even recognize that you're being humiliated. So the point that I'm making here is often individuals have to have some degree of um, positive self-esteem or self-determination to even recognize that this is a, an assault uh, on them. Okay, I've got two more pages and this is, a uh, we'll get through. So recently, Isabel Wilkinson, in her book, Cast, The Lies That D Divide Us, 2020. Now this book only came out one month ago. So this is very new. She attempted to draw together and develop a theory of caste that system of dividing and humanizing practices that I referred to earlier, but she did it differently. It was an ambitious task. She wanted to sew together synergies between the experiences of African Americans, arguing that race relations in the United States represented a form of casteism. She said this casteism bore similarities to the Indian caste system and the experiences of racial categorization and the human categorization of the Nazi regime. So this is interesting. So she's, she's saying that the experiences of African-Americans, uh, she's reframing it in terms of caste and she's saying that the other examples of caste are the Indian caste system and uh, the German scientific, scientific racism um, under the Nazis. In that book, Wilkinson argues that what we understand by race in, in America is in fact a system of caste relations. This work, of course, it's early days, has run the gauntlet of critique, 
particularly around her removal of certain key concepts to understand race. So in fact, the word race actually disappears and her replacement of racial categories with terms like dominant caste, ruling majority, favored caste, etc. It's too early to say what the response to this work will be in terms of a sharp critique and dialogue, because I think we need to talk about these things. There's too much critique sometimes, not enough dialogue. However, it is a timely reminder of the dangers of conflating different experiential systems, epistemological frameworks, and points of reference used by activist groups. And this is the important point that I wanna make in this paper. You cannot just simply lift one approach to theorization and associated, and I can never pronounce this word, associated nomenclatures, in other words, the words we use, and transpose them to another social grouping, be that at the level of epistemology or not taking into account the investments, not taking into account the investments in social identities. In other words, you know, this can be perceived as quite hurtful when you've um, been involved in uh, civil rights around race um, and that's part of your identity and or, or in fact disability activism. It's uh, very close to your sense of self. However, there is an opportunity there is an opportunity to see where there are points of convergence between the experience of different minoritized groups. And it is also within the COVID moment of crisis to explore terrains, bodies of knowledge and experiences we have not encountered before to increase our knowledge about why dividing practices work, especially the mainly uncritical impulse to classify populations and significantly enable sections of the community um, to benefit from them. Right. Gayatri, so I'm on the last stretch now. Gayatri Spivak in 1998, uh, the influential post-colonial subaltern scholar points to the need, and she uses this phrase, the need to engage in strategic essentialism. Now, this is a phrase that's often been picked up even in the disability area. The idea that you might not believe that you're disabled, maybe you might not identify as disabled, but you need to uh, refer to yourself as disabled to get classified, otherwise you don't get access to services, right? So uh, she and she so she says uh, that we need to engage in strategic attempt essentialism if we are to engage in the storying and representations of our experience, including identity claims in law. However, such essentialism needs to be used strategically if we are to work towards accessible futures for all. So when these categories start oppressing us, that's when it becomes uh, problematic. Many societies still rely on population designations and enumerations in order to implement distributive justice and equality measures. We give power to ableist practices when strategic essentialism takes on the appearance of normalized relations between human beings. In other words, by using these categories, we start actually believing these categories are in fact real and they represent life. This paper has been an attempt, albeit unsuccessfully or unsatisfactorily, to explore how studies in ableism and ableism as a concept can be used to, as a bridge to further explore the processes of dehumanization and to then look at possibilities for rehumanizing social life. The global pandemic has exposed a nasty, uh, you can take the slides down if you want. The global pandemic has uh, exposed a nasty, virulent underbelly of hostile attitudes towards minoritized peoples. Studies in ableism can assist in unpacking the preconditions for making certain sections of our community communities disposable. I think it's really interesting that the language of disposability is appearing more and more. And as I said to you, it is permissible. It's not seen as um, insulting. With COVID-19, the concealed has now become revealed, it's out in the open, in the playing out of various government promulgations and media portrayals about disabled people, people of colour, migrant workers, displaced persons, and ideas of boundaries, borders, and nationhood. And this is the sad bit. I've never in my 30 years as an academic written this. We see the return of speech acts that characterise people in terms of vermin, leeches and burdens on the state. This combined with the rise of right-wing attempts to reconfigure who are the people, ideas of nation. 
And therefore, by way of inversion, who are the excluded, the redundant uh, and uh, indispensable? Shulamit Volkov, in her exploration of the failure of the emancipation project of Jews in Germany in the 1930s, notes that despite emancipation being a central prong of the Enlightenment's discourse of rationality, emancipation towards Jews was granted without, without passion. Indeed, the so-called logic of liberalism and its claim of social inclusion were shaped. Uh, she argues that this project failed. Why? Because inclusivity was not based on any, quote, this is her quote, genuine sense of partnership or solidarity with Jews, end of quote. In short, under liberalism, emancipation and inclusion are conditional and provisional, as we have seen regarding trends in treatment towards migrants, people of colour, refugees and disabled people during this time of COVID-19. Studies in ableism is a conversation, a space for critical dialogue to appraise the limits of neoliberal in, in enlightenment equality claims. Studies in ableism as political theory, a conceptual framework and as a template for practice can bring together disparate communities in solidarity, but also, and importantly, in difficult conversation. We need to have the difficult, we should not be running away from difficult conversations to work together towards accessible futures for the subalterns of the world. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this. Uh, as I said, this paper could have been maybe three times larger than what it is to go in detail. Um, I am currently just, just before I hand over, just writing some papers when I get the time and I am also in good health because health is always a challenge for me. Uh, writing some papers on self-identification in law, uh, disability and uh, caste. I'm writing some papers on this and I'm also writing paper on COVID-19 and disability consciousness raising because uh, there are many people with underlying health conditions who in the past before COVID-19 have not identified as disabled who are now um, having to rethink uh, uh, with their identities. So thank you uh, very much. Uh, I understand the paper is getting sent to you. Uh, so I am yes, happy. It's already. There Very is good. A link That's here. good. That's good. So I just so so before I hand over, what I would like to say, the way I work is I uh, I learn from other people. We learn from each other, and um, uh, please doesn't matter who you are. Uh, please uh, contact me and read the paper. Maybe there are areas I should have drawn out more or should have clarified. Maybe there were areas that I missed out on. Uh, please please contact me, and uh, um, I would like to have that conversation. So thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona. Very, very interesting talk. Uh, it's also an opportunity for me to thank Jim Bloom for, from the American Friends of the Hebrew University, uh, who made this possible, who made it possible for us to bring you virtually here, as well as our guests in the other few days that we have. Uh, so I hope Jim will be listening to us and we very much appreciate your help on this. And we might have some other people also to be thinking uh, in addition. And one of the particular people that um, I would also like to thank are our partners from the Center for Disability Studies, uh, Michal Shmuel and Efrat Stern from uh, Joint Israel, who are our partners in this for the last few years. So I did want to take the opportunity to also thank them. Uh, I want to be passing it over uh, to Anat Greenstein and say a few words about Anat before I do pass it over for some words of commentaries. So Dr. Anat Greenstein is the author of the book Radical Inclusive Education, Disability, Teaching and Struggles for Liberation, which I know I use a lot in my teaching. So also a personal thanks to you, Anat. Uh, she worked in the UK and in Israel to rethink basic, basic assumptions of education and schooling rather than just striving to better fit disabled students into an unjust and unequal system. She is a member of Ishale Isha, the Haifa Feminist Center where she works to connect disability politics 
and anti-capitalist and anti-oppressive activism. So without further delay, I look forward to hearing you on that. Thank you, Shirley. Uh, Ofer, can you bring up my presentation, please? Yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you, Shirley, for inviting me. And thank you very much, Fiona, for... Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, so, and, and, and really thank you, Fiona, for this great paper and, and for all your work that, that really helped me through the years to, to think in much greater nuance um, about analyzing the way um, disability and, and other marginalized and oppressed groups um, are actually socially constructed. Um, so to, to start us off, I want to, to draw attention. Can you, um, the, the next slide, please, Ophel? Um, I want to draw attention to, to a distinction that really helped me, um, I think, better understand uh, the concept of ableism and, and also to orient activism campaigns and, um, and conversations as well as campaigns around the, this, these tensions between the more specific issues related to disabled people and the wider and, and more fluid ways in which things are um, socially constructed. So I feel that when I, when I started engaging with the social model, it gave me this really potent tool of understanding disablement and indeed in this sense also this idea of disabilism, the ways that um, society directly discriminates against disabled people, against people with impairments. So we all know these examples of inaccessible services, um, sort of demands to prove that you are capable. So, so disabled people seeking to become parents have to prove that they are worthy of parenthood and think, uh, things like that. And this is a concept that is, um, I think, akin to the notion of homophobia, the ways that society directly discriminates against homosexual people. Um, the, the, the studies in ableism allows us to really um, widen these explorations and explore in much more subtle ways um, the ways in which society first creates these standards and definition of what counts as able-bodied, sound, mind, and normal. So these are definitions that are not natural, but are socially created. Then it enforces those norms through a variety of means that range from socialization and sort of um, what, what Foucault calls disciplinary power, to sheer violence against people's bodies, minds, liberties. Um, and finally, after enforcing these norms, to present these kind of standards of ability as natural and desirable, and ironically, at the same time as they are seen as sort of natural and universal, also seen as uh, superior. And this concept of ableism, I think, is in akin to the notion of heteronormativity. So, so this distinction between homophobia and heteronormativity really helped me to, to think through the distinction between disableism and ableism. And in terms of how to orient um, activism or demands for social change around these concepts, I think that both concepts are really useful and that we cannot, and, and, and you referred to that tension earlier, Fiona, we cannot let go of one of them. Um, so so this, the fighting challenging disableism really helps us to, to look at specific practices, to, to call to our aids things like the courts, laws, regulations, um, whereas challenging ableism helps us to both understand the interse and intersectionality and the way different oppressions work uh, at the same time simultaneously and with differences 
so that we can widen our struggle to include many forms of injustices and many forms of um, people who are oppressed and discriminated against, as well as allow more diversity within our own movement. So, so the experiences of disabled people um, from different nationality groups, from different uh, areas in the country, who are more or less educated, um, et cetera, et cetera, different genders. And uh, all these can, can become clearer when we draw our attention to ableism rather than to specifically uh, disableism. Uh, okay, next slide, please, Ophel. So to give a bit of an example of how both these notions um, can inform struggles, the, the priority documents, uh, Fiona, you talked about the, the document in the UK, here in Israel, there was quite a similar document prioritizing who can get access to ventilators um, in, in, if, if, there is, uh, if the, the, the health system is overloaded. Um, and, and there was a big struggle against that document by disabled people's organization, and I think many of the people who were part of this struggle are actually here today um, and 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 looking at the ways and challenging the ways this document specifically discriminates against disabled people is using anti-disabilist practices to demand the authorities um, to give equal treatment to disabled people that's something that that really makes huge material difference in people's lives. But the activism against, the campaign against this pa um, paper also included exploring notions of ableism. So exploring the question of why work is used as a criteria um, for meaningful life, for productive life, for life that are worth protection is exploring ableist notions. The exploring why being able to walk is used as a criteria and why narrow, why independence is seen as a, a goal that makes certain lives worthier than other kinds of life that are more interdependent or indeed if, if there is such a thing of independent, but, but even if there is why this is used as a value is an example of how ableism also in, uh, informs these kinds of campaigns and practices and helps us um, make wider social changes beyond this kind of um, regulatory framework. Okay, so the next slide, please. Um, and so uh, it, for the purposes of this paper, I want to kind of focus on uh, the way occupying space um, works and, 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 and racism and ableism converge and diverge around this notion of um, how we occupy space. And, um, and, and for disabled people, occupying space has long been an issue. So the, the separation of, of, of disabled people into their own unique spaces because mainstream spaces are made inaccessible to people. This is both in terms of physical access, so issues like um, stairs, etc., but also um, more particularly things like having different schools or different classrooms because these spaces are, um, are, are not meant for disabled people. Public transport, all these things. Um, occupying space also is quite central to questions of how people can move around across national borders. So we are seeing here a picture of a dinghy with refugees in the Mediterranean Sea, sort of make, trying to make its way from Africa to Europe and how, how people are being cast around in the sea. We are also seeing a picture of um, a campaign that's quite prominent in Israel right now around access to a river called the Assi River and who can or can't come in um, and that there are huge um, arguments right now around the rights of the, the kibbutz to keep 
people from surrounding um, towns uh, out, out of this river. So, so this has also been, and of course, the, the separation wall, this has always been a big issue, both when, when looking at issues of questions of, of racism and nationality and in questions of disability. Now, the way we occupy space is also changing and, and changing massively now in these times of COVID-19. So, as I'm sure you've all noticed with this conference, um, flights are being canceled, the national borders are being controlled. They, they are always controlled and always certain kinds of people cannot come in or out. Uh, through national borders, but the definition of who is a danger to society has changed through COVID-19. Um, we, we've seen how these sort of disability spaces, such as institutions, um, are coming under, under more investigation, at least in our movements, in, in the way that um, that there, it's called institutional leaving, but actually what we're talking about is institutional dying. Okay, so, so this, these institutions um, have already been linked to reduce life expectancy before the COVID-19 and, and in these days, really in institutions, we see increased exposure to the pandemic and to its lethal consequences. Um, and of course, we, we are seeing that the increased surveillance of, um, of the state, of the police, uh, and of the Shin Bet on people's movements, uh, increasing police violence towards people not wearing masks in public space. And again, the ways we are vulnerable to this police violence is mitigated um, by our uh, different group uh, identities and belongings, so, so the, the police violence against ultra-Orthodox Jews, for example, not wearing masks is greater um, than, than towards, say, secular Jews not wearing masks. Um, okay, so um, there, there, and there are also intersections um, around disability and racism and, and migration, so, so for example, are, Matt, just um, to say that there are about two minutes. Ah, okay, so I'm, I'm jumping, uh, skipping this. Oh, how can I have the, the new slide, sorry. Uh, the next slide, please. So, so, um, so I want to look at, at the, the Justice for Yad campaign and, and how this kind of really show, highlights these intersections between ableism and racism. So just to give you a quick background to those who are not from here. So Iyad al-Halak um, is a 32 years old autistic Palestinian man. He was shot and killed by the Israeli border police on the 30th of May 2020 in East Jerusalem. And his death evoked a lot of rage in the, Palest rage in the Palestinian community and really an unprecedented level of empathy from many Jewish Israelis. And so the family's morning tent was visited by several parents of disabled people and, and also by religious and political leaders, which is really unusual. And following a campaign by disability activists and organizations, the Israeli president has established a government committee that is aimed at improving the engagement of law enforcement officers with disabled people and sort of reducing, reducing violence in these interactions. If we adopt the, the, this distinction we made earlier between anti-disabilism campaigns and anti-ableism campaigns, the creation of this com um, committee is a clear example of anti-disabilist work. So the idea is that police officers will now learn to better identify disabled people, even those with uh, hidden impairments, recognize their access needs and respond accordingly to reduce violence. So for example, recognizing that someone has anxiety issues and that if you surround him with a circle of standing police officers that will exacerbate the anxiety 
and it is better to to approach um, with one officer say sitting down rather than standing in front of them or that someone cannot hear a call to stop so this is an anti-disabilist um, campaign and if the if the committee is um will be successful it which there are doubts about that uh, already because the police has stopped cooperating with the committee um, but if it will be successful and um, implemented it could have really wide-ranging implications for the lives of disabled people however i'm arguing that in order to promote this anti-disabilist work the campaign inadvertently i think it's not what the activists were um, aiming for but how it was uh, promoted in the Israeli media and more widely ge uh, general politics, it inadvertently also promoted two quite ableist notions. The, notions that, the notion that disability is a master identity that overrides any other kinds of identities such as um, gender and uh, nationality, and the notion that disabled people and particularly autistic people are somehow inherently childlike innocent and apolitical so the next slide please um, so the the um, the notion of autism as as this sort of or disability as a master identity we saw at the heart of the campaign this um envisioning of Yad al-Halak as an autistic person um, who is one of us. So many autistic activists described him as someone who is, uh, where the quote here is that for me, uh, yeah, it, it's personal. Yad al-Halak is me and uh, my friend. Another quote here is from a sister of, um, of an, an autistic person saying, that um, I can imagine, imagine my brother in the same situation and it breaks my heart. They are both uh, Israeli Jews. So this notion of disability as a master identity, the main identity that counts and trumps all other identities is not a new um, notion, but it's most often used as a tool of othering. Um, what Fiona earlier referred to as, as these functions of differentiation and ranking of uh, identities. So disability or more often impairment labels are used to justify placement in special education settings away from the community and the family, to justify institutional re uh, restrictions on rights and liberties, and to construct disabled people as categorically different and less than fully human, as Norman Kunz, the American activist, argues. Here, ironically, we see that um, the disability is called on to actually bring Yad into a collective we and draw him closer, draw him out of his Palestinian identity into this notion of being one of us, casting him as fully human rather than as the enemy. Um, in that the campaign has succeeded in countering processes of othering both of disabled people and of Palestinians, but, and, and, and presenting Palestinians in, in human light, which is something in the Israeli media we often, we, we usually see only from a journalist called Gidon Levy, who is usually portrayed as a traitor. Um, but but it, was, it was doing that, it was, it was successful in doing that only because it set up autism as the only relevant identity uh, and leaving, Palestine, leaving the national identity and gender identity out, outside of the equation. And the last slide, uh, I'm, I'm finishing very quick. Can you hear me on that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So let's try to, to, to finish. This is the last minute. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so the, 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 the other um, inadvertent ableist assumption that was promoted by this campaign is that basically this, being autistic means that you're innocent. Um, so the proof of Iyad not being a terrorist, of his killing being um, not only a tragedy, but a wrong that must be corrected through state intervention, was the fact that he was autistic 
Um, and that was presented as, as sort of someone who doesn't even differentiate between Jews and Arabs. His running away from the police was seen as a response to his own impairment, um, portrayed as being in his own bubble, uh, being confused, not understanding the situation, where you could also see it as, as understanding the situation perfectly well, a situation where police uh, threaten a Palestinian person in a neighborhood where police raids, police shootings, and police killings are very common. And it, it um, leaves this notion of, of what it means to be politically resistant to a situation as a quite narrow ableist notion. I wrote more about that in a different paper and because I need to finish, I will stop now and we can maybe discuss this in the question and answers. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anat, for this uh, offer. I th oh, wonderful. Thank you, offer. Uh, so it really, this is the time for us. Uh, we don't have too much time, but we do have a time for a couple of questions. Uh, I would appreciate uh, ahead of time if you can state your questions uh, briefly so that uh, we have enough time to answer and maybe also the responses, if they can be brief in this way, we can get uh, more questions in. Um, so there are many questions in the chat and also some people that raise their hand. Uh, so uh, in a, I, I say, I'm sorry if there's anyone that I'm not getting to, and I assume you can ask all these questions afterwards to both Fiona and Anat and to any of us. Um, so I did see, Yaakov, that you had a question. Did you want to ask it? Yes. Hi. Um, in Israel, there is no um, equal opportunity, general equal opportunity law, and there's no e a human rights commission. There is a, um, there is a, a law about um, the rights of people with disabilities, and a law, uh, the equal opportunity law, and a law about equal, equal opportunity in employment, and equal opportunity about uh, goods and services. That means in other way that a, people, a, a guy that is also belongs to a mandatory group and is also disabled, he has to fight like with two commissions and he's protected about uh, with two laws. The, this can also maybe um, um, affect our uh, believings about, about the, the <coughs> The abilities of uh, of people with disabilities um, versus the abilities of people that belongs to miniature uh, to any miniature groups, but it also can make some difficulty uh, about people that belongs to two groups that is now is now able to to get all like to fight this fight uh, until the end. Do you have maybe something to say about that? Yeah, thank you for uh, your comments. I think uh, a couple of things. I think one thing with the UN uh, Convention on the Rights of Disabled People is it's forcing countries to um, review their existing legislation. And often many countries have uh, loose legislation, as you have said, bits and pieces of legislation that there is a, a disconnect between. Um, on the other hand, um, some countries have worked towards what's called consolidating legislation, which like in the UK, it used to have separate laws for different groups, right? And then they brought it all together under the Equalities Act uh, 2010. But there are problems with this because what happens is uh, there is a tendency in anti-discrimination law to group people into silos, into strict categories. And you've already mentioned that. That's also a problem. It disregards intersectionality. So which do you choose in? Like I'm a member of myself for marginal groups, yeah? And uh, I have this joke about running from one room to the other for our staff networks. Um, actually, I would be wheeling. Um, but also what we also are now finding now is conflict of rights. So for example, I mentioned earlier about self-identification. There is a battle being played out in the UK uh, uh, around uh, gender reassignment certificates and what it means to be a woman, so sex-based rights. But uh, you, you get this, uh, or maybe more work is done on race issues as against disability. So I think um, there are some challenges here, and this is where I think studies in ableism works, because actually, 
fighting with each other is not great. It's not good. Uh, it's very counterproductive. Uh, what we should be doing is actually exploring the synergies, but also exploring our um, uh, the differences. But I would be uh, fighting, by the way, for a human rights uh, commission um, uh, to talk about these common points of reference. Um, I, I agree with, with Fiona. I think that, that the real power of, of this notion of studies in ableism is that it enables us to look beyond these kind of group uh, borders. Uh, personally, I'm not a very legalistic activist, so I'm, I'm usually not really very interested in this sort of campaigns to, to change laws and to create committees and regulations because I think that, well, A, A, because it's not my field, I think it's really, really important. It's just not something I'm personally interested in doing, but also because I think we really need simultaneously to challenge the, the social discourses and understandings and the way we think about issues, not just how we um, enact them into laws that by nature are very inflexible, rigid and, and, and kind of uh, contain people in places and not allowing new openings. So I think, and, and that for me, the interesting work is, is precisely to point out to these areas where, where you have, which are not covered by law. And, and I think this is really interesting work to do. Yeah, can I just come come back at you and and uh, actually I don't think they're mutually exclusive. One of the things I argue, I mean I'm from a law background, but I'm also a philosopher. So actually I think actually the t terrain of ideas uh, is really in important to interrogate because actually ultimately it's those ideas that percolate in terms of how we frame legislation and and in fact the classificatory practices I mean look how medicines come into its own here uh, so and where do these ideas come from so I agree I think we need multi-level activism thank you thank you to the both of you uh, I did see a question from from a uh, Samir but I think he's left his path but oh hi Samir Welcome back. Uh, Samir, I saw that you had a, a few questions. Uh, can you pick one of the questions, Samir, that you had and ask it? I think he has bad connections, so maybe you can meet okay. one of his questions. Samir, you can hear us, right? See, uh, is it okay for me to read out one of the questions? Uh, <laughs> uh, Samir uh, said in his chat that he agrees with the larger project to say, I respond to Gottman who argues that human beings active agents of their life. Uh, so he's proposing a scenario where a disabled is an activist in her public life, but wants to play a gendered role in a private domain. Uh, in the Indian context, 30% of people that have a disability certificate, uh, let's see, I might be missing here. Uh, so even disabled negotiates compulsory ableness. I hope I'm asking the question correctly as you stated it, Samir. I mean, I get, I get, I get the gist of it, and and I must say, even for myself, I mean, I'm a biracial uh, person. Again, here I'm critiquing identity politics, and I'm giving you labels, but hey, we've got to have a language, yeah. I'm so, so I'm biracial. I'm I'm a lesbian. I have multiple disabilities, and you know, I'm from a Jewish and Buddhist background, which totally confuses everybody. Um, so I think what I'm saying is, uh, uh you know, the the. the but not all, not all these things operate at once. There's different inflections. And I think that's where careful intersectionality theory is important. And I should say there's actually quite some quite poor intersectional theory. Um, and sometimes activists use these theories without thinking about what they mean. And in fact, can I say in my 2019 article, Precision Ableism, I refer, because I come from an activist background, that was my first first career is activism before becoming an academic. But one thing we need to watch 
is like uh, shorthand terms, you know, like intersectionality being used without people thinking about uh, how they are using them. So, so, so we have multiple cells that uh, are expressed in um, different ways. Where, where ableism is very useful is that um, when we have multiple cells, for example, that are not privileged Okay, so uh, I mean, I, most of my other multiple cells are seen as marginal. Um, uh, my privilege is the fact that I have an education, which is highly unusual with a person with my background. And now I'm a professor, which is a super privilege. Um, so it's about using those um, aspects and seeing how those aspects actually impact upon our lived experiences. Thank you, Fiona. And you could show Sheila. Yes, we have your time. You're actually next on my list. אוטיסטים נחשבים אה, לא פוליטיים או לא מבינים את המפה החברתית, אז האם הם בעצם אה, הם מחוץ לפוליטיקה, כי במילא הם לא מבינים את המשחק החברתי, ואז הם כאילו אה, מחוץ לספירה הזאת מבחינת האנשים, ואז הם כאילו יכולים לשמש ככלי פוליטי לשינוי בכללי, יותר, מבעל, יותר מאנשים עם מוגבלויות אחרים. Anat, you want to take this uh, question? Should I answer in English or in Hebrew? Uh, yeah, yeah, can somebody, yeah, can you actually translate the question so we know what was being asked? So the, um, so, sorry, what is it? Yotam, was it? Yes, Yotam. Yotam. So Yotam um, said, he, he was asking me to clarify whether I was saying that um, autistic people um, are unpolitical and um, outside of the, the kind of social norms and that therefore they can be a bridge um, to, to the politics, am I right? Is that what? Yes, I don't know if I didn't say it until the end, but yes. Maybe I don't know if I can do it, because I know that the autistic people Okay, so, um, so my answer to you, um, first of all, I don't think if, if I don't know if that came across from what I'm saying. I don't think autistic people are apolitical, but I think that the success of the campaign and the reason that, that there was such a wide consensus around the Adel Halak, which um, very often we don't get around other Palestinians who are shot by the police. Um, and just, just the other day, we heard about uh, Yaakov el um, that, that that was called a terrorist for, for many years, and now um, they were saying, well, actually, we knew for a long time that he wasn't one, but he wasn't. And um, so I think that the fact that um, there was such a consensus around the Adel Halak was because he was autistic and because his autism was presented under a tragedy model, okay? So this is quite a key issue. He was presented as autistic and therefore someone who is inherently weak and worthy of our pity. And, and I think it is dangerous, although it, it did bring a humanizing aspect of the Palestinian community into the mainstream media in Israel, which is very rare. And, and usually we never see Palestinians as people. And, sort of in the discussion of his life and, and particularly of his family's life and the, their loss and their mourning. Many people identified with that and so what happened to him as injustice. I think there are a lot of dangers both for the Israeli-Palestinian process and for disability rights 
in um, using Iyad in such a way because it, it only allows him to be part of the discourse as long as we, we see his life as tragic and worthy of pity. Um, yeah. Yeah, can I actually, can I just add to that? I, I totally agree with you. I think that's where I, in the paper I picked up the idea of scaling, that scaling of suffering and the, how the trope of pity works. And can I, can I say, and that even in my own situation, now I'm a wheelchair user, I've had our academics, disability studies academics actually say, oh, you should not come out as autistic yourself uh, because um, either people won't believe you or, or again, this is, it's kind of like it nullifies one's uh, activism uh, or expertise. So I think if we are going to look at um, uh, denoting and representing autism, we need to have the, the range of autistic experiences, like the range of dis disability experiences. And we can talk about tragedy, but as long as it's also counteracted by other kind of representations at the same time. Thank you very much to the both of you, both for, a, of course, wonderful talks uh, and for uh, taking that time to give the responses here. Uh, I know that there were many other questions in the chat, which probably just means uh, one of two things. Either any of you that have a question that did not get an answer to, you can feel free probably to ask uh, Fiona and Anat or email them. Uh, the other opportunities for all of us to come back in about a year time and see each other here again and bring up all the topics that they did, we did not have enough time uh, to answer. Uh, and the third thing that comes in as an opportunity for us is to see all of you back here tomorrow because we will be here again at 2 p.m. Uh, tomorrow we have a panel that will deal with the issue of a accessible society uh, post-corona. Uh, the word that I like most on this title is the, the word post, and I hope we will be here in the post <laughs> corona time. Uh, the panel tomorrow will be in Hebrew, but nevertheless, we invite anyone who wants to join us to be there. And thank you everyone for coming here. Uh, 